Section 6 of The Pastor's Wife by Elizabeth von Arnim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 6. You might as well try, she thought, to buttonhole water. And she would laugh and go back to whatever she was doing with a blithe feeling that it was very ideal, this perfect independence of one another, this spaciousness of freedom to do exactly what each one liked. The immense tracts of time she had, how splendid this leisure was after the close detail of every hour at home in her father's study. When she had got over the first difficulties of German, and need no longer devote most of her day to it, she would get books from England and read and read. All the ones she had wanted to read, but had not been allowed to. Oh, the magnificence of marriage, thought Ingeborg, beating her hands together, the splendor of its liberations. She would go off in the morning with the punt full of books, and spend long glorious days away in the forest, lying on the green springy carpet of whortleberries, reading. She would most diligently work at furnishing her empty mind. She would sternly endeavor to train it not to jump. All the books she possessed she had brought with her, and spread over the living room. The wedding presents, which had enriched her with Hardy and Meredith and Kipling and Tennyson and Ruskin and her own books she had had as a girl. These were three, the Christian year given to her on her confirmation by her father, Longfellow's poems given her on her eighteenth birthday by her mother, and Dumas Tulipe Noir given her as a prize for French because Judith did not know any, one summer when a French governess was introduced, thoughtlessly, the bishop said afterwards, into the palace. This lady had been removed from the palace again a little later with care, every corner of her room being scrupulously disinfected by the searching of Richards, who found, however, nothing except one book in a yellow paper cover called Bibi et Lulu, Mère de Montparnasse. And even this was not in her room at all, but in Judith's, beneath some stockings. Herr Dremmel took up one of the wedding volumes, when first he saw them in the sitting-room, and turned its pages. It was the shaving of Shagpat. Tut, tut, he said presently, putting it down. Why, Robert? asked Ingeborg, eager to hear what he thought. But he patted her abstractedly, already slid off again down into regions of reality, the regions in which his brain incessantly worked out possible chemical combinations, and forgot with completeness that sometimes even surprised himself that he had a wife. Invariably, however, he found it pleasant on re-emerging to remember her. She asked to be shown his experimental fields, and he took her with him very amiably one hot morning, promising to explain them to her. But instantly on reaching them he became absorbed, and after she had spent an hour sitting on a stone, at the edge of a strip of lupins beneath a haggard little fir tree which gave the solitary bit of shade in that burning desert watching him going up and down the different strips examining apparently every single plant with johann she began to think she had better go home and look after dinner and waving good-bye to him which she did not see she went a day or two later she asked whether it would not be good and pleasant that his mother should come over to tea with them soon. He replied amiably that it would be neither good nor pleasant. She asked whether it might not be a duty of theirs to invite her. He replied after consideration, perhaps. She asked whether he did not love his mother. He replied unhesitatingly, no. 
she then went and sat on his knee and caught hold of his ears and pulled his head up so that he should look at her but robert she said well little sheep since their marriage he had instinctively left off calling her a lamb the universe which for a time she had managed to reduce into just a setting for one little female thing had arranged itself into its proper lines again the lamb had become a sheep a little one but yet no longer and never again a lamb he was glad he had been able to be so thoroughly in love he was glad he had so promptly applied the remedy of marriage his affection for his wife was quite satisfactory it was calm it was deep it interfered with nothing she held the honourable position he had always even at his most enamoured moments known she would ultimately fill the position next best in his life after the fertilizers his house so long murky with widows was now a bright place because of her approaching poetry he likened her to a little flitting busy bird in spring always he was pleased when she came and perched on his knee well little sheep he said smiling at her as she looked very close into his eyes her face seen so near was charming in its delicate detail in its young perfection of texture and colouring scrutinizing her eyes he was glad to notice once again how intelligent they were presently there would be sturdy boys tumbling about the garden with eyes like that grey and honest and intelligent his boys carrying on far more efficiently the work he had begun well little sheep he said suddenly moved oughtn't one to love one's mother she asked perhaps but one does not do you oh poor mother said ingeborg quickly her mother far away was already becoming a rather sad and quite tender memory all those days and years on a sofa and all the days and years still to come now she knew better now that she was married herself what it must have been like to be married to the bishop to have twenty years of unadulterated bishop she no longer wondered at the sofa she was full of understanding and pity one does no doubt at the beginning said herr dremmel and then leaves off is that all children are born for that they may leave off loving us he became cautious he talked of the general and the individual of many mothers and some mothers of the mothers of the present generation he called them the gewesene and the mothers of the generation to be born he called them the werdende and presently as she sat rather enigmatically silent on his knee he developed affection for his mother explaining no doubt that it had always been there but like many other good things when life was busy and a man had little time to go back and stir them had lain dormant and he now thought indeed he recognized that it would be excellent to urge her to come over soon and spend an afternoon or still better a morning but you're not here in the morning said ingeborg ah that is true i am present however at dinner but nobody ever knows when i might perhaps arrive early in this way the elder frau dremmel who had her pride to consider as the widow of her neglectful son's traditionally appreciative father and who would consequently never have taken what she called in her broodings the first step did about seven weeks after the marriage cross the threshold of her daughter-in-law's home chapter fourteen the visit was arranged to begin the following friday at four for ingeborg thought the afternoon feeling was altogether more favourable to warmth 
than anything you were likely to get before midday, and Johann drove in to Munich to fetch Frau Dremmel in time for that hour. There was to be tea out in the garden the first thing, because tea lubricates the charities, and then, with the aid of a dictionary, conversation. Ingeborg had had time to think out her mother-in-law, and was firm in her resolve that no artificial barrier, such as language, should stand in the way of the building up of affection. If necessary, she might even weave the German for giants, umbrellas, ease, and spectacles into a sentence as a conversational opening, and try her mother-in-law with that. And if Frau Drummel showed the least responsiveness to either of these subjects, she might go on to wax, fingers, thunder, and beards, and end with prince's boats and shoulders. That would be three sentences. She could not help thinking they would be pregnant with conversational possibilities. There would be three replies, and Frau Dremmel, being in her own language, would, of course, enlarge. Then Ingeborg would open her dictionary and look up the words salient in the enlargement, and when she had found them, smile back, brightly comprehending and appreciative. This, including having tea, would take, she supposed, about fifty minutes. Then they would walk a little up and down in the shade, pointing out the rye field to each other, and that would be another ten minutes, perhaps. Then at five, she supposed, Frau Dremmel would ask for and obtain the carriage and go away again. Ingeborg made up her mind to kiss her at the end when the visit had reached the doorstep stage. It would not be difficult, she thought. The doorstep, she well knew, was a place of enthusiasms. She and Ilse were immensely active the whole morning preparing, both of them imbued with much the same spirit with which, as children, they prepared parties for their dolls. But this was a live doll who was coming, and they were making real cakes which she would actually eat. The cakes were of a variety of shapes, or rather contortions. The coffee was of a festival potency. Sandwiches meant to be delicate and slender were cut, but under the very knife grew bulky. It must be the strong German air, Ingeborg thought, watching them, perplexed by this conduct. And there were the first gooseberries. When the table was set out under the lime trees, and finished off with a jug of roses, she gazed at her work in admiration, and the further she got away from it, the more delightful it looked. Nearer it was still attractive, but more with the delusive attractiveness of tables at a school treat. Perhaps there was too much food, she thought. Perhaps it was the immense girth of the sandwiches. But down from the end of the path it looked so charming that she wished she could paint it in watercolors. The great trees, the tempered sunlight, the glimpse of the old church at one end, the glimpse of the embosomed lake at the other, and in the middle, set out so neatly with such a grace of spotlessness, the table of her first tea-party. Frau Dremmel arrived in a black bonnet with a mauve flower in its front to mark that ten years had been at work upon the mitigation of her grief. Her son came out of his laboratory when he heard the crashes of the carriage among the stones and holes of the village street, and he was ready at the door to help her down. He was altogether silent, for he had been torn from the middle of counting and weighing the grains in samples of different treated rye, and would have to begin the last saucerful all over again. Beside this brevity, Ingeborg, in a white frock and wearing the buckled shoes of youth, with the sun shining on her freckled fairness, 
and bare neck and her mouth framed into welcoming smiles looked like a child she certainly did not look like anybody's wife and the last thing in the world that she at all resembled was the wife of a german pastor again frau dremmel as she had done that day at Muck, turned her eyes slowly all over her while she was receiving her son's abstracted kiss but she said nothing except to her son guten tag and passively submitted to ingeborg's shaking both her hands which were clothed in the black cotton of decent widowhood do say something robert murmured ingeborg say how glad i am say all the things i'd say if i could say things herr dremmel gazed at his wife a moment collecting his thoughts why should one say anything he said she is a simple woman no longer young my wife he said to his mother desires me to welcome you on her behalf ach said frau dremmel ingeborg began to usher her along the passage towards the back door and the garden frau dremmel however turned aside halfway down it into the living room oh not in there cried ingeborg we're going to have tea in the garden robert please tell her but looking round for help she found robert had gone and there was the sound of a key being turned in a lock frau dremmel continued to enter the living room before she could be stopped she had arranged herself firmly on its sofa but tea said ingeborg following her and gesticulating tea you know out there in the garden she pointed to the door and she pointed to the window frau dremmel slowly took off her gloves and rolled them together and undid her bonnet strings and looked at the door and at the window and back again at her daughter-in-law but did not move then ingeborg making a great effort at gay cordiality and determined that when words failed affectionate actions should fill up the gaps bent over the figure on the sofa and took its arm won't you come she said adding a sentence she had taken special pains to get by heart liebe schwiegermutter and smilingly but yet when it came to touching her rather gingerly and certainly with her heart in her mouth she gently pulled at her sleeve frau dremmel stared up at her without moving liebe schwiegermutter tea garden better said ingeborg still smiling but now quite hot she could not remember a single german word except liebe schwiegermutter frau dremmel urged and encouraged was finally got out of the house and into the garden and along between the gooseberry bushes to where the tea-table stood and an armchair for her with a cushion on it she went with plain reluctance she did not cease to stare at her daughter-in-law especially her gaze lingered on her feet becoming aware of this ingeborg tried to hide them but you cannot hide feet that are being walked on and when she sat down to pour out the coffee she found her short skirt was incapable of hiding anything lower than above her ankles she grew nervous she spilt the milk and dropped a spoon beside the rigid figure in the armchair she seemed and felt terribly fluid and uncontrolled the cheek that was turned to her mother-in-law flushed hotly she acutely knew her mother-in-law was observing this and that made it hotter if only thought ingeborg she would look at something else or say something over the rim of her cup however frau dremmel's eyes moved up and down and round and through the strange creature her son had married the rest of her was almost wholly motionless ingeborg had nervously swallowed three cups of the black stuff before frau dremmel was half through one 
At last a German word flashed into her mind, and she flung herself on it. Forn wunderschön, she cried, waving her hands comprehensively over all the scenery. For an instant Frau Dremmel removed her eyes from her daughter-in-law's warm and quivering body to follow her gesture, but seeing nothing soon got them back again. She made no comment on the scenery. Her face remained wholly impassive, and Ingeborg realized that the rye field would be no use as a means of entertainment. She could not again say schon, and the meal went on in silence. Frau Dremmel's method of eating it was to begin a piece of each of the cakes and immediately leave it off. This afflicted Ingeborg, who had supposed them to be very lovely cakes. Frau Dremmel's place at the table, she had pulled her chair close up to it, was asterisked with begun and abandoned cakes. On the other hand, she ate many of the sandwiches, and they drew forth the only word she said to Ingeborg during the whole of tea. Fleisch, said Frau Dremmel, removing her eyes for one moment from Ingeborg to the sandwiches that were being offered her, and with a dingy, investigating forefinger, lifting up that portion of each sandwich which may be described as its lid. Ja, ja, said Ingeborg responsively, delighted at this flicker of life. It was, however, the only one. After it, silence, complete and impenetrable, settled down on Frau Dremmel. She did not even speak to her son when half an hour later he came out in search of the coffee he had failed to find on his doormat. Her manners prevented her, in his house, on this first visit after his marriage, from uttering the unmanageable truths that come so naturally from the mouths of neglected mothers. And except for those she had nothing to say to him. Herr Dremmel expected nothing. His deeply engaged thoughts left no room in him for anything but a primitive simplicity. He was hungry and he ate, thirsty and he drank. The silent figure at the table, of whose presence every nerve in Ingeborg's body was conscious, produced no impression on him whatever. Robert, do tell your mother how I really do want to talk to her if only I could, said Ingeborg, pressing her hands together in her lap, and tying and untying her handkerchief into knots. There were little beads on her upper lip. The rings of her hair on her temples were quite damp. He glanced at his mother, drawn up and taut in her chair, and immediately she turned her eyes on to him, and stared back at him steadily. Little one, he said, I have told you she is a simple woman, not used to or capable of wielding the weapons of social arts. Be simple, too, and all will be well. But I am being simple, protested Ingeborg. I'm dumb. I'm blank. What can I be simpler than that? Then all is well. Give me coffee. He ate and drank in silence, and got up to go away again. Frau Dremmel looked at him and said something. Is it the carriage? asked Ingeborg. She wants to go indoors, said Herr Dremmel. Indoors? She says she does not like mosquitoes. He went away into the house. There was nothing for it but to follow. As they reached the back door, the church clock struck five. But Ingeborg, glancing at her mother-in-law's impassive face, saw the sound meant nothing to her. She followed her into the living room and watched her helplessly as she arranged herself once more on the sofa. When the clock struck half-past five, she was still on it. She seemed to be waiting. For what was she waiting? Ingeborg asked herself, whose handkerchief was now rubbed 
into a hard ball between her nervous hands impossible either to move her or communicate with her rigidly she sat her eyes examining the room and each object in it but yet not for an instant missing the least of her daughter-in-law's movements ingeborg seized her dictionary and grammar and made a final effort to build a bridge out of them across which their souls might even now go out to meet each other but frau dremmel did not seem to understand the nature of her efforts and only stared with a deepened blankness when ingeborg read her out a sentence from the grammar that dealt with whether they were not that day having what was she waiting for seven o'clock struck and still she waited the clock in the room ticked through the minutes and every half hour they could hear the church clock striking ingeborg brought her a footstool brought her a cushion brought her in extremity a glass of water began to sew at a torn duster left off sewing at it fluttered nervously among the pages of her grammar poured in her dictionary and always frau dremmel watched her she found herself struggling against a tendency to think of her mother-in-law as it at seven she heard ilsa go home singing happy ilsa able to go away soon afterward she finally faltered into immobility giving up sitting now quite still herself in her chair the flush faded from her cheek pale and crumpled it was her and robert's supper time soon it would be their bedtime quite soon it would be to-morrow and then it would be next week and then there would be winter coming on was this visit never to end at eight it at last became plain to her that what frau dremmel was waiting for must be supper this was terrible for there was none at least there was only that repetition of tea and breakfast that made her and robert's lives so wholesome she had calculated the visit on the basis of tea only and had prepared only and elaborately for that for half an hour she sat on and hoped she was mistaken she did not know that in east prussia if you are invited to tea you also stay to supper but at half past eight she realized that there was nothing for it but to go and fetch it in when the ruins of the same meal that had been offered her once already were produced a second time and set out clumsily on the unaccustomed living-room table among the pushed-aside merediths and kiplings the bones of this skeleton being slowly put together under her very eyes and ingeborg at last by ceasing to go in and out fetching things and sinking into a chair indicated that that was all frau dremmel after waiting a little longer opened her mouth and startled her daughter-in-law by speech brett katoffel said frau dremmel ingeborg sat up quickly after the hours of silence it was uncanny brett katoffel said frau dremmel did you did you speak said ingeborg staring at her brett katoffel said frau dremmel a third time ingeborg jumped up and ran across the passage to the laboratory door robert robert she cried twisting the handle come come quickly your mother she's talking she's saying things there was the same excitement and wonder in her voice as there is in that of a parent whose baby has suddenly and for the first time said papa herr dremmel came out at once from the sound of her he felt something must have happened she seized him and pulled him into the living-room now listen she said holding him there facing the sofa herr dremmel looked perplexed what is it little one he asked listen she'll say it again soon said ingeborg eagerly what is it mother he asked in german frau dremmel without moving her head ran her eyes over the table 
are there not even not even she began but stopped she was evidently combating an emotion thunder of heaven said herr dremmel looking from one woman to the other what is it but frau dremmel was not able after hours of waiting for a supper that seemed to her in every detail a studied insult on her daughter-in-law's part to bear harshness from her son drawing out a handkerchief that had no end and that reached to her eyes while yet remaining in her pocket she began to cry ingeborg was appalled she ran to her and kneeling down begged her in english to tell her what was the matter she called her liebe Swagermutter over and over again she stroked her sleeve she patted her she even laid her head on her lap but frau dremmel for the first time did not notice her she was saying detached things into her handkerchief and they were all for her son a widow wept frau dremmel a widow for ten years when i think of your dear father how much he thought of me my first visit my visit on your marriage treated as though i were anybody forced to drink coffee out of doors like a homeless animal no sofa no real table flocks of mosquitoes no supper no supper at all nothing prepared for me for the mother for your sainted father's wife his cherished wife long before you were thought of if it had not been for me you would not have been here at all nor she and i am to go home unfed uncared for not even the least one has a right to expect given one not even what the poorest peasant has each night not even again she said the magic word bratkartoffel there there said ingeborg soothingly stroking her anxiously there there robert what is bratkartoffel but never mind never mind said frau dremmel wiping her eyes only to weep afresh soon i shall be with him with him again with your dear father and this this is nothing oh nothing it is only the will of god there there said ingeborg anxiously stroking her chapter fifteen it was not until some days later that she discovered the reason for her mother-in-law's tears she could get no information from herr dremmel his thoughts were not to be pinned a minute to such a subject he swept her questionings away with the wave of the arm of one who sweeps his surroundings clear of rubbish and the most that could be extracted from him was a general observation as to the small amount of good to be obtained from proximities but ingeborg one afternoon walking longer than usual facing the hot sun and the flies and sand of the road beyond the village to see where it led to instead of as she generally did exploring footpaths in the forest came after much heat and exertion to a thicket of trees that were not firs or pines but green cool things oaks and acacias and silver birches and going through them along a grass-grown road fanning herself with her hat as she walked in the pleasant shade found herself stopped by a white gate a notice telling her she was not to advance further and a garden beyond the flower-beds and long untidy grass of this garden she saw a big steep-roofed house built high on a terrace on the terrace a dog was lying panting with its tongue out nothing else alive was in sight and there were no sounds except the rustling of the leaves over her head and such faint chirping as birds make in july who lives in that big white house way over there she asked herr dremmel when next she saw him which was not till that evening at supper and she nodded her head her hands being full of the coffee-pot in the direction of the north herr dremmel was ruffled he had been plunged in parish affairs 
since breakfast for it was the day appointed by him and recurring once a fortnight into which by skilful organizing he packed them all the world in consequence on every second tuesday appeared to him a place of folly people were born and lived embedded in ancient folly the folly of their parents already stale when they got it was handed down to them intact not shot at all thought herr dremmel on these alternate tuesdays with the smallest ray of perception of different and better things the school-children were still learning about bismarck's birthday the schoolmaster was still laboriously computing attendances and endeavouring to obey the difficult law which commanded him to cane the absent the elders of the church were still refusing to repair the steeple in time the confirmation class was still meeting explanations and exhortations with thick inattention the ecclesiastical authorities were still demanding detailed reports of progress where there was not and could not be progress couples were still forgetting marriage until the last hurried moment and then demanding it with insistent cries infants were still being hastily christened before the same neglects that killed those other infants who else might have been their proud and happy grandparents carried them off and peasants were still slinking away at the bare mention of intelligence and manure he was exceedingly ruffled for while he had been wrestling with these various acquiescences and evasions his real work was lying neglected out there in the sun in there in the laboratory and a whole day of twelve precious hours was gone for ever and when ingeborg said who lives in that big white house herr dremmel with his wasted day behind him and the continued brassiness of the heavens above him and the persistence in that place of trees of mosquitoes stared at her a moment and then said bringing his hand down violently on the table hell and devils who said ingeborg we must call on them at once what my patron he will be incensed that i have not presented you sooner i forgot him that will be another day lost these claims these social claims he got up and took some agitated steps about the table no sooner he said frowning angrily at the path has one settled one thing then there appears another to-day all day the poor to-morrow all day the rich do we call continuously all day both equally obstinate both equally encased from head to foot in the impenetrable thick armour of intellectual sloth how he inquired turning to her with all the indignant wrath of the thwarted worker is a man to work if he lives in a constant social whirl ingeborg sat regarding him with astonishment he can't she said but do we whirl robert would one call what we do here whirling what when my work has been neglected all day to-day on behalf of the poor and will be neglected all day to-morrow on behalf of the rich but why will it take us all day a man must prepare he cannot call as he is he must said herr dremmel with irritable gloom wash and he added with still greater irritation and gloom there has to be a clean shirt but began ingeborg he waved her into silence i do not like he said with a magnificent sweep of his arm clean shirts she stared at him with the parted lips of interest i am not at home in them i am not myself in a clean shirt for at least the first two hours don't let's call said ingeborg we're so happy as we are nay said herr dremmel immediately brought to reason by his 
wife's support of his unreason but we must call there are duties no decent man neglects and i am a decent man i will send a messenger to inquire if our visit to-morrow will be acceptable i will put on my shirt early in order to get used to it and i will endeavour by a persistent amiability so long as the visit lasts to induce my patron to forget that i forgot him herr dremmel had for some time past been practising forgetting his patron he had found this course after divers differences of opinion simplest and most convenient the patron baron glombeck of glombeck was a serious real christian who believed that the poor should like some vast pudding that will not otherwise turn out well be constantly stirred up and he was unable to approve of a pastor who except in church and on every alternate tuesday forbore to stir it was for this forbearance however that herr dremmel was popular in the parish before his time there had been a constant dribble of pastor all over it making it never a moment safe from intrusion here pastor dremmel might be fiery in the pulpit but he was quite quiet out of it he was like a good watchdog savage in its kennel and indifferent when loose kokensee had as one man refused to support the patron when he had wished some time before to bring about herr dremmel's removal its pastor did not go from house to house giving advice its pastor was invisible and absorbed these were great things in a clergyman and should not lightly be let go nothing could be done in the face of the parish's opposition and kokensee kept its pastor but baron glombeck ceased to patronize divine service in kokensee and until herr dremmel brought ingeborg to make his wedding call he had had no word with him for three years the dremmels had announced themselves for four o'clock and when they drove up to the house along the shady grass road and through the white gate they were met on the steps of the terrace by a servant who if he had been in redchester would have been wilson on the top of the steps stood baron glambeck tightly buttoned up in black formal grave further back beneath the glass roof of the terrace stood his wife tightly buttoned up in black formal grave they were both if ingeborg had known it extremely correct according to the standards of their part of the country they were unadorned smoothed out black she abundant in her smoothness he spare in his and they greeted ingeborg with exactly the cordiality suitable to the reception of one's pastor's new wife who ought to have been brought to call long ago but was not in any way responsible for those bygones which studded their memory so disagreeably in connection with her husband a cordiality with the chill on dignity and coats of arms pervaded the place monograms with coronets were embroidered and painted on everything one sat on or touched the antlers of deer shot by the baron with the dates and places of their shooting affixed to each bristled thickly on the walls they saw no servant who was not a man please take your hat off said the baroness in english carefully keeping her voice slightly on the side of coldness ingeborg was very nearly frightened she would have been quite frightened if she had been less well trained by the bishop in unimportance she had however owing to this training left off being shy years before she had so small an opinion of herself that there was no room in her at all for self-consciousness and she arrived at the glambecks in her usual condition of excessive naturalness ready to talk 
ready to be pleased and interested. But it was conveyed to her instantly on seeing the baroness, there was an astonishment in the way she looked at her, that her clothes were not right, and just the request or suggestion or demand, she did not know which of these it really was, that she should take off her hat, made her realize she was on new ground, in places where the webs of strange customs were thick about her feet. She was, for a moment, very nearly frightened. "'You will be more comfortable,' said the Baroness, without your hat. She took it off obediently, glancing beneath her eyelashes, as she drew out the pins at the Baroness's smooth black head and unwrinkled black body, perceiving with the clearness of a revelation that that was how she ought to look herself skimpier of course for the years had not yet had their will with her but she ought to be a version of the effect done in lean she resolved in her thirst after fulfilled duty to get a black dress and practice she thought it wisest not to think what her hair must be looking like when her hat was off for she had not expected to be hatless and well did she know it by nature for a straggler, a thing inclined to wander from the grasp of hairpins and go off on its own account into wantonings and rings which were all the more conspicuous because of their lurid approach in colouring to the beards of her ancestors, sun-kissed Scandinavians who walked the earth in their strength hung according to the way the light took them, with beards that were either the color of flames or of apricots or of honey. Well, if they would make her take her hat off, by the time she was on the sofa, she was presently put on in the inner hall, she had caught up with her usual condition of naturalness again, and sat on it, interested and forgetful of self the baroness's eyes wandered over her and they wandered over her with much the same quality in their look that had been in her mother-in-law's and always when they got to her feet they lingered her skirt again reached only to her ankles all her outdoor skirts did that but i can't help having feet thought ingeborg noticing this they were small by nature and the artful shoes of the London shoemaker who had shared in providing her and Judith's trousseau made them seem still smaller. She did not try to hide them as she had tried when Frau Dremmel stared. It was Frau Dremmel's heavy silence that had unnerved her. These people talked, and the Baroness's English was reassuringly good. Nobody, the Baroness was thinking, and also simultaneously the baron, who was fit to be a pastor's wife, had feet like that, little incapable feet. Nobody indeed who was a really nice woman had them. One left off having them when one was a child, and never had them again. The errands of domesticity on which one ran, the perpetual up and down of stairs, the hours standing on the cold stone floor of servants' quarters, seeing that one was not cheated, the innumerable honorable activities that beautified and dignified womanhood necessitated large loose shoes. A true wife's feet should have room to spread and flatten. Feet were one of those numerous portions of the body that had been devised by an all-wise creator for use and not show. As for the rest of Frau Pastor's appearance, there were, it is true, some young ladies in the country who dressed rather like that in the summer, but they were ladies in the Glambeck set, ladies of family or married into family that the person who had married one's pastor, a man 
whose father had been of such obscure beginnings and indeed continuations that even his having been dead ten years hardly made him respectable should dress in this manner was a catastrophe already they had suffered too much from the conduct of their loose-talking unchristian pastor and now instead of bringing a neat woman in black to be presented to them a neat woman with a gold chain perhaps round her high black collar it being a state occasion and she after all newly married but only a very light chain and inherited not bought and a dress so sufficient that it reached beyond and enveloped anything she might possess in the way of wrist or ankle or throat here was the most unsuitable wife he could have chosen short of course of marrying among jews while as for her hair when it came to her hair their thoughts ceased to formulate that small and flattened and disordered head like a boy's head run wild like something on fire which emerged when she took off her hat coffee was served on the big table in front of the sofa the baroness sat beside ingeborg and the baron and herr dremmel drew up chairs opposite the coffee was good and there was one excellent cake no gooseberries no flowers no unwieldy sandwiches just plainness and excellence the two men talked to each other not to the women the baron stiffly and on his guard herr dremmel taking immense pains to be amiable and not offend between them hung the memories of altercations between them also hung the knowledge of the three years during which the baron and his wife as a result of the last and hottest difference of opinion had attended divine service in a church that did not belong to them they had altogether cut kokensee for three years their private gallery in the church in which their ancestors had once a fortnight feared god had been a place where mice enjoyed themselves its chairs were covered with dust its hymn-books growing brown still lay open on the place the glambacks had praised god out of last such a withdrawal of approval would have made any other pastor's life a thing of chill and bleakness herr dremmel hardly observed it he had no vanities he was pleased that the rival pastor should be gratified he cared nothing for comment and had no eye for shrugs and smiles his eyes his thoughts were wanted for his work and he found it a relief a release from at least one interruption when his patron took to leaving him frigidly alone indeed when he drove up to the glambeck's house and remembered he had not had to go there for three peaceful years he felt really grateful and he showed his gratitude by performing immense feats of social pleasantness during the visit he agreed gigantically with everything the baron said whatever subject was touched upon very cautiously for the baron mistrusted all subjects with herr dremmel he instantly dragged it off the dangerous shoals of the immediate and close up to a cosmic height and distance a height and distance so enormous that even what the kaiser said last became a negligible tinkling and conscience and dogma quavered off into silence and he explained to the baron who guardedly said perhaps that though people's opinions might and did vary seen near if one spread them out wide enough pushed them back far enough took them up high enough bored them down deep enough got them away from detail and loose from foregrounds one would come at last to the great mother opinion of them all in whose huge lap men curled themselves up contentedly like the happy identities they indeed were and went after kissing each other 
in placidest agreement to sleep. Perhaps, said the Baron, personalities, immediate interests, duties, daily life, were swamped in the vast seas in which, with politeness but determination, Herr Dremmel took the Baron swimming. One only needed, he repeated, warm, with the wish to keep in roomy regions, to trace back any two opinions, however bitterly different they now were, far enough to get at last to the point where they sweetly kissed. Perhaps, said the Baron. One only needed, went on Herr Dremmel, making all embracing movements with his arms. But the Baron cleared his throat and began to enumerate contrary facts. Herr Dremmel agreed at once that he was right just there and pushed the point of kissing back a little further. The Baron went after him with more facts. Herr Dremmel again agreed and went back further. In this way they came at last to the Garden of Eden, beyond which the Baron refused to budge, alleging that further back than that no Christian could go, and even in that he repudiated the kiss. He was convinced, though he concealed it, that at no period of human thought could his and Herr Dremmel's opinions, for example, have kissed. But it was an amiable view, and Herr Dremmel was extremely polite, and was bent evidently on peace, and the Baron, recognizing this, became less distrustful. He even contributed a thought of his own at last, after having been negatively occupied in dissecting Herr Dremmel's, and said that in his opinion it was details that made life difficult. The Baroness, who loved him and overheard him, was anxious he should have more coffee with plenty of milk in it after this. Men, she explained to Ingeborg in careful English as she poured it out, need much nourishment because of all this headwork. I suppose they do, said Ingeborg. When I was first married, I remembered it was my chief pride and joy that at last I had some one of my very own to nourish. Oh, said Ingeborg. It is an instinct, said the Baroness, who had the air of administering a lesson in a true woman. She wishes to nourish, and naturally the joy of nourishing two is double the joy of nourishing one. I suppose it is, said Ingeborg, who did not quite follow. When my first born, oh, yes, said Ingeborg, glad to understand. When my firstborn was laid in my arms, I cannot express, Frau Pastor, what happiness I had in being given yet another human being to nourish. I suppose it was delightful, said Ingeborg, politely sympathetic. The Baroness's eyes drooped a moment inquiringly from Ingeborg's face to her body. For six years, she went on, after a pause, I had a fresh reason for happiness regularly at Christmas. I suppose you have the loveliest Christmases here, said Ingeborg, like the ones in books, with trees. Trees? Naturally we have trees, but I had babies as well. Every Christmas for six years, regularly, my Christmas present to my dear husband was able to be a baby. What? said Ingeborg, opening her eyes. A fresh one? Naturally it was fresh. One does not have the same baby twice. No, of course not, but how did you hide it till Christmas Day? It could not, naturally, said the Baroness stiffly, be as much a surprise as a present that was not a baby would have been. But it was for all practical purposes hidden till Christmas. On that day it was born, Oh, but I think that was very wonderful, said Ingeborg, genuinely pleased by such neatness. She leaned forward in her enthusiasm, and clasped her hands about her knees. Yes, said the Baroness, relaxing a little before this flattering appreciation. Yes, it was. Some people would call it chance, but we at Christmas knew it was heaven. 
but how punctual said ingeborg admiringly how tidy yes yes mused the baroness relaxing still more in the warm moisture of remembrance they were happy times happy happy times one's little ones coming and going oh did they go as well as come asked ingeborg lowering her voice in condolence about one's knees i mean and the house oh yes said ingeborg relieved every year the christmas candles shining down on an addition to our treasures every year the gifts of past christmases gathered about the tree again bigger and stronger instead of being lost or broken as they would have been if they had been any other kind of gift but what happened when there weren't any more to give then i gave my husband cigar cases oh after all most women have to do that all their lives i d did not grumble when heaven ceased to provide me with a present for him i knew how to bow my head and went and bought one there are excellent cigar cases at wertheim's in konigsberg if you wish to give one to herr pastor next christmas they do not come unsown at the corners by july or august in the way those one buys in other shops do ah yes happy years happy happy years first the six years of great joy collecting my family and then the years of happiness bringing it up of course you are fond of children End of section six